In 2013, this Cessna 170B model crashed in California. It was approaching Auburn Municipal Airport, and this accident led to discussions about applying new limitations to existing airplanes. It's relevant to over 100,000 airplanes, of which tens of thousands remain flying. The airplane was approaching the airport with full flaps, likely at idle power, and at about 75 miles per hour. This is a normal approach speed for the Cessna 170. They were overshooting the runway, however, so a correction was made to increase the descent. This was likely the introduction of a forward slip. For a short time, this worked. The airplane's angle of descent steepened. The rate of descent increased to about eight or 900 feet per minute. While this is high, it's not excessive. Airspeed remained about 75 miles per hour with small corrections. At about 200 feet above the ground, the airplane abruptly pitched nose down and impacted terrain about one quarter mile short of the runway. Both people aboard unfortunately perished. The NTSB mentioned that the Cessna 170 manual advises avoiding slips with flaps. Turns out I have the resources to explore this issue a little bit. My name's John, I have some planes, let's fly this crash. We have to understand how the wing is affecting the way air flows around our tail. So let's imagine a cloud of bugs and let's fly an airplane through them. After that airplane flies through that cloud of bugs, the bugs are generally pushed downward. This is due to downwash from the wing. We can sometimes even use this downwash as an indirect measurement of how different parts of the wing are making lift. Usually the downwash is stronger near the middle of the wing, and towards the tips where wingtip vortices make the wing less efficient, there's less downwash. Sometimes we can even see this happen when airplanes fly in mist or in rain. Civilian airplanes are typically designed to be stable, and that means the center of mass is typically forward of the center of lift. This difference in location creates a strong force couple that wants to tuck the airplane's nose downward. Fortunately for us, the downwash from the wing hits the top of the tail. It acts like a little upside down wing, creating downforce. This downforce at the tail wants to pull the nose upward, and it balances out the force couple from the wings and the center of mass. If we visualize the downwash from the tail, it would look something like this. All pilots have some experience dealing with downwash over the tail when we learn how to do stalls. When we stall an airplane, at least most general aviation airplanes, we notice the nose drop when the stall breaks. In a stall, smooth airflow separates from the wing. When air no longer flows around the wing, downwash at the tail is lost. This means air goes from hitting the top of the tail to hitting the bottom of the tail. The tail can no longer stop the nose from dropping. Besides a stall, there are other ways we can lose downwash at the tail and still have some surprising pitch results. Let's start by reviewing how flaps change airflow around the plane. As flaps are deployed, the camber of the wing is increased, and, at least in planes with straight wings, the center of lift moves farther aft. This makes that nose down couple even stronger. Flaps also increase downwash, so the increased downwash increases tail down force, and the forces should more or less cancel each other out, or at least require just gentle retrimming. From the point of view of the tail, this increased downwash looks something like this. You'll note that there's more downwash behind the flaps, and there's some new vortices, just like wingtip vortices, at the ends of the flaps. If we somehow remove this increased downwash from our tail, however, that stronger nose down couple prevails, and the nose wants to tuck below the horizon, sometimes pretty aggressively. And it's moving that downwash away from our tail that's exactly what we're doing when we slip our Cessnas with flaps, at least under certain conditions. If we don't go too far, we encounter the vortice from that flap tip at our tail. As the vortice interacts with the tail, it oscillates, removing some and then returning some of that downwash to the tail. This creates changing elevator demands in order to hold our pitch attitude. At first, we don't even notice this. It's uh, probably hidden inside our normal corrections for turbulence, etc. But as we go in a little bit deeper, we have to pump the yoke noticeably in order to hold our pitch attitude. And it's this phenomenon that's described later in Cessna Skyhawk handbooks. So when we continue into a full slip, things become even more interesting. We move the tail out of the downwash from the flaps entirely, and in fact we push the tail into an area of reduced downwash that's created by the upturned aileron. Cessna's manager of flight test and aerodynamics referred to this as relative upwash increment. For the sake of simplicity, I'm just going to call it a lot less downwash. At high angles of side slip, the fuselage also generates its own vortices that interfere with and reduce any remaining downwash that may have otherwise affected the Lee horizontal stabilizer. The result is a noticeable and unstoppable tuck in the airplane's pitch until the slip is reduced. 
This effect gets worse with forward CG and worse with increasing airspeed. Let's talk about why. In this little cartoon, the blue wind arrow is the air that flows over the inboard sections of the wings and is affected by the flaps. The pink, Pepto-Bismol colored arrow is the air that flows over the outboard section of the wings. Like we discussed earlier, if we move the tail out of the downwash from the flap, we feel the airplane try to pitch downward due to less downforce at the tail. But what if we go faster? Well, at faster speeds, we have a lower angle of attack, and that means less downwash. So, when we yaw the tail out from behind the flaps, we have an even more pronounced loss of downforce and a more abrupt tuck of the nose. You've seen flaps 40 at 70 miles per hour earlier. This is what flaps 40, a full slip, looks like at 80 miles per hour. Note the uh, uncontrollable drop of the nose. Here's what flaps 40 at 85 miles per hour looks like in a full slip. At this point, the nose drop is more abrupt and we start throwing things around the cockpit. These explanations aren't ideas I've pulled out of thin air. This is how Bill Thompson, Cessna's former manager of flight test and aerodynamics, explained things in his book, Wings for the World. But he does go on to say something else. Quote, although not stated in the owner's manual, we privately encouraged flight instructors to explore these effects at high altitude and pass on the information to their students. So, decades ago, I went out and did this in various Cessnas. And I've done it again in the Cessna 170B specifically. Here's what I found this time. The vertical scale is the speed we were at when we started slipping. Along the bottom is the amount of rudder travel I used. At the top, there's a dashed line. This shows that I didn't actually test anything above 90 miles per hour. This is because I wanted to conserve my flaps, so I was only able to extrapolate the lines in that direction. This chart is for all 40 degrees of flaps. We were loaded at the forward edge of the utility category between 1,800 and 1,850 pounds, depending on how much gas I burned. When we use full rudder in the slip, at low speeds, we only get elevator oscillations, and even those don't become prominent until somewhere around 70 miles per hour. Around 75 miles per hour, we start to approach loss of pitch control. Between 75 and 80, these are noticeable, but not startling, decreases in pitch. Above 80, the pitch loss becomes more abrupt, and at 85, the airplane experiences about a half a G tuck. At 90, this decreases to around one third of a G. So you'll see there's not much variation in behavior at the lower end of the airplane's approach speeds when you slip with flat. As speed increases, however, the change in the airplane's behavior becomes greater. So just five miles per hour difference between 80 and 85 miles per hour is the difference between a gentle kind of gee whiz loss of pitch to something that's really attention grabbing. Between 85 and 90 miles per hour, the change in airplane behavior is considerable indeed. You'll also notice that not much happens if we use less than half rudder travel. Let's put ourselves into this accident. The NTSB provided ground track and drive attitude and speed information in their report, so we can use Google Earth to recreate the last minute of this flight. Most pilots discuss and think about stall events close to the ground and in the pattern, rightly so. These account for a large number of accidents. Also, let's assume these pilots, like me, have been slipping with flaps at low speed with only mild elevator oscillations for a long time, and they've only had successful outcomes. So if they're surprised with a sudden drop of the nose, will their first thought be, we've stalled? My money is on the idea that the crew will think they've stalled. Close to the ground, there's a lot of things that prevent us from adequately analyzing and diagnosing an issue. We're close to the ground. We don't have much time to look at things. And we have a lot of things that are getting our attention, the runway, obstacles, etc. Let's think about a generally average three to 500 hour pilot encountering this at about 200 feet above the ground. If they know to simply yaw the plane's nose back into the wind and remove the slit, the landing will be uneventful. Maybe a little long, but uneventful. If, however, they misidentify the situation as a stall and apply the wrong recovery, they will be in a catastrophically nose low condition just above the ground. This airplane was at 75 miles per hour when they started that uh, slip. That's right at the edge of where we start to see nose tuck. And it's this that's the risk of slipping to land with flaps and Cessnas. The plane won't explode, your flaps won't disintegrate. The risk is that you have to accurately identify the cause of burbles close to the ground. And if you get it wrong, it can be fatal. And it's when we're close to the ground that even the best of us can get things wrong. Does this mean that people who slit their Cessnas with flaps are irresponsible? No, I've done it, and I just did it a lot for this video. Here's a video of somebody else doing it in a Cessna 180. What it does mean is you have to understand your airplane and balance the risks yourself. And doing so requires a healthy respect for the airplane and a lot of humility. 
On the other hand, if you avoid sleeping close to the ground, you reduce the number of variables that you have to think about when you're close to that ground. That makes properly assessing the situation and properly reacting to surprises all that much easier. Incidentally, the pitch issue is unlikely to be a problem for crosswind landings regardless of your flap setting. Thanks for taking the time to watch my video.